Is Mirazan's Rise the hardest Mythic Plus dungeon of all time? Is it the worst? Has there ever been a single dungeon with more frontal cones cast on a tank? Hi, it's Laryl, and today I'm going to tell you what I do to tank Mirazan's Rise. I spoke about this dungeon in a recent video. It has been nerfed, and those nerfs affected boss and trash damage, with a couple of small but welcome nerfs to some mini boss health pools. Despite those nerfs, it's still one of the most difficult dungeons to time compared to most other Mythic Plus dungeons because you have to spend so much time traveling through the dungeon. I did a little thing that was kind of just for me in the last Mirazan's Rise video, I don't know if anyone noticed, and I thought I would just point it out here. After killing Tyr and entering the gauntlet, I tried to mainly use footage of me running between bosses and trash poles, riding mounts, taking portals, watching RP, and so on. It was all basically 10 minutes of footage from a single dungeon run, just running back and forth, no fighting, just walking and talking, Aaron Sorkin would be proud. No matter how much damage you have, you can't make that part of the dungeon faster. Because of this, the timer is extremely tight, so it's a difficult dungeon to clear on time, especially at higher levels. This dungeon's also built like a maze, and the in-game dungeon map doesn't help. It's built like a different, second maze that doesn't correspond to the dungeon it's made for. So it's two mazes for the price of one, no coupon required. This was made even worse by how much damage the dungeon's trash and bosses deal, which made it way more dangerous than any other dungeon at its key level. Genuinely, a plus 24 Ataldazar feels easier than a plus 20 Mirazan's Rise, or at least it did pre-nerf. And that is bad. The nerfs lessen the difficulty of staying alive in here, but not of timing the key. So I would rate this dungeon incomplete. Final grade incomplete, you can do better, see me after class. With that being said, you do have to do this place if you want Mythic Plus rating. There is some useful gear here, and I don't think it's awful the entire time you're in the dungeon. It really only has three segments that I do not like. But the rest of the dungeon? It's kind of okay. Not great, but fine. Now for the usual disclaimer before I walk through the route. My goal is to talk about what I do to maximize the group's chances of finishing the dungeon easily and relatively quickly, and limit the possibility for other players to make mistakes. This is specifically oriented toward pug groups, and it definitely is not the absolute most efficient route possible, and that's totally fine. You can pull more aggressively if your group is up to it. With that being said, this route should be fine all the way from a plus two up to like a 23 to 25. For higher levels, I would be more aggressive throughout the entire dungeon. And here's my MDT route for this dungeon. It's on the screen right now. I will put a pastebin link to copy the import string into your MDT in the pinned comment. I once again recommend using MDT. It's a great add-on. The first thing you'll notice in this MDT is that I've drawn arrows to indicate the flow through the dungeon. This is for two reasons. First, the dungeon's layout is confusing and the in-game map is extremely unhelpful. Second, the dungeon requires backtracking at multiple points, which only adds to the confusion. I've used green arrows to indicate the flow through the dungeon and blue arrows to indicate the spots where you have to backtrack. The silver lining of this dungeon is that it doesn't actually have that much trash. Because of the limited trash, hitting 100% is pretty easy, and while there is one very minor skip, all you have to do is walk past some patrols once they move out of the way. You don't need shroud or invis pots to get past anything. Not that it doesn't hurt, it's just not necessary. In the MDT, I have a very safe pull at the start, but I usually perform a pretty big pull at the start of this dungeon. I like to drag the first two mobs that are just at the bottom of the ramp, up the ramp to the three mob pack, and then I grab the four mob pack from the left as well. So nine guys at once. You can bring in the two mob patrol if you're up to it, 11 guys. Doing this as a big pull with nine or 11 mobs in it is a lot easier to handle on a Demon Hunter Paladin or Death Knight. The Twilight Maguses like to cast Corroding Volley and interrupting those is really important. Now Leg Sweep and AoE stuns can kind of get the job done okay, but Demon Hunter and Paladin really have a huge advantage just at locking down all of these casters. Death Knight's main value here is really just that they can grip the pack together very quickly so that other players can crowd control or just cleave them down before they get a chance to cast. If it's bolstering week, or if I'm just not that confident in the group's ability to interrupt the corroding volley casts, I will split this into two poles that I quickly chain from one into the next. After dealing with them, I go around the platform clockwise. I like to clear all the trash on the platform before doing the boss. I really don't want any of it to be alive and just get pulled in by accident. Spurlock is the first mini boss, and he's the most difficult and important. 
He has a two part ability in which he charges towards a random player, drops the shrouding sandstorm around himself and channels binding grasp on one of your party members. As the tank, this is your job to deal with. Now, anybody technically can interrupt it, but really, I think you're best doing this as the tank. As soon as he charges, you follow him and immediately interrupt the binding grasp. Then you drag him out of the sandstorm and you just repeat that until he's dead. Pretty simple. The other two mini bosses are even simpler. Lurai pulses damage to the group and shoots out an orb that you will want to dodge. If it hits you, it does a uh, pretty long stun and a lot of damage. It boomerangs out, it heads straight out and then comes back to the same spot. So you want to try to drag her away from there after she sends it out if possible. She does like to stand still and cast immediately after throwing the orb out, so that isn't always doable. She deals a lot of damage, so don't mistake her simplicity for being easy. She definitely can kill people, but it's very uninteresting damage. It's just damage. That's it. Valo uses Temporal Strike, which punches the ground at the point where you were standing when he started the cast. So you just move slightly to the side and this mechanic does nothing. He also casts Titanic Bulwark, which drops a massive damage reduction shield. Move him and the rest of the trash out of it. Pretty straightforward stuff. For higher level keys, you will have to pull some of these mini bosses together, specifically Valo and Lorai. The overlap of Titanic Bulwark onto the other mini bosses is really, really lame, so I prefer not to do that, and I have not recommended that in the MDT, but it will speed this section up slightly if you're trying to really get through this faster at a higher level. After you've killed the mini bosses, you fight Tyr. He has about 35 seconds of RP before he spawns, which is more than enough time to remind the group to bait cones toward the outside of the room. Mega Chickenfish left a comment on the last video recommending that you can kill the three mini bosses to start this RP and then clean up the remaining side packs of trash while the boss is talking. And that's a great suggestion. That can definitely save you 30 seconds and given how tight this dungeon's timer is, that's pretty huge. If you have any time left over, you can spend it, I don't know, reflecting on the life choices that brought you into Mirazan's Rise. Once you've dealt with your existential crisis and killed Tyr, you face a pretty nasty two mob pull at the top of the stairs. I immediately drag them down the stairs so that their mechanics are easier to dodge, and I focus and interrupt the Marauder's Displaced Chrono sequence, which applies a huge shield to it if it goes off. Once those two guys are dead, you're off to the first bad part of this dungeon, the Gauntlet. You have to run all the way to the other side of this area without touching any of the enemies in here and without getting hit by any of their balls or cones. I find running around the outsides of the rooms makes dodging the balls a little easier compared to cutting straight through the middle. They had extremely terrible hit detection early on in, in the patch, but I think Blizzard maybe made some changes to fix them without saying anything because they aren't as desync now as they had been early on in this dungeon's life cycle. This section is terrible, but once it's done, you're on to deal with some more terribleness, the double dragon pull. You want to immediately run forward and spawn these guys once you get through the gauntlet. Then you want to come back and channel in the portal to the left so that other players who are struggling can teleport through. Be sure to call out in party chat once the portal is finished spawning. One positive note here, this is the new respawn point if anybody dies and releases. The gauntlet is behind you now. This double dragon pull is worth bloodlusting if it's available. The diversionist deals massive group wide damage, so you do want to kill it first. Make sure to skull it even so that people will focus it. The saboteur does a very deadly frontal cone on the tank, so point it away from the group. The graphic from the tank cone is the exact same color as the timeless curse, the big bronze swirly stun circles that both dragons like to cast, and it will overlap so that you can't see the stun circles. This pull is terrible on tanks. Just try not to get stunned, best of luck, try not to kill anybody with the frontal cone, try not to die to it yourself, there's really no sugar coating, Blizzard did a very bad job with this pull, one of the worst of all time. Once these guys are dead, you're onto my actual least favorite part of the dungeon, the sand pit. This area is filled with very dangerous sand. The way you clear it is by killing teeny tiny little trash mobs near the sand pools. When they die, they explode and that clears out a small section of sand. You basically have to clear this area by chain pulling mobs and carving a path to the direction you want to go, which is the Northwest Teleport. It's in the back left of the room if you're just walking in from the normal entrance. Barrage roads are actually really good in this section. I, that is the one tank I would say I had no problems in here uh, at all on because pulling mobs from range on a bear is super easy. You just tap them with Moonfire. Most of the rest of the tanks have a really tough time. Monk is definitely the worst. I have to tap mobs with crackling jade lightning. It's a nightmare. 
In order to get out of this evil area, you need to kill all four infinite rift mages to unlock the portals out of this zone. When they die, they create teleporters that connect to each other, so you can space out their deaths to make skipping through this area safe or whatever. It's a pretty cool idea, but it absolutely does not land in the context of just doing random pugs in this one room of this dungeon. Two of the rift mages are on the left side of the room, one is patrolling the front, and one is over on the right side, sort of the back right. So I like to clear the room on the left side and sort of just a straight line to the portal we're going toward, opening up space in case anyone dies so that they can quickly run to that left hand portal to get back to us. We're talking later on in the dungeon. I try to clear out all the patrols that could get in the way as well. You don't need to clear all the way over to the lone rift mage that's channeling on that right side, you just need to pull it from range and kill it. All you really need here is four dead rift mages and a safe path to the left portal and you're good to go. Once you go through the portal, there's one trash pull you want to kill on its own, you face the Chronaxi away from the group and sidestep its chronal eruption casts, help interrupt the time beams that these guys cast, kill them, you're done. Once you walk through the time gate, you enter the final bad section of this dungeon, the infinite battlefield. This area is filled with constantly fighting Horde and Alliance NPCs. If someone dies here, rezzing them is pretty difficult because these mobs like to pulse players into combat all the time. They spawn affixes like Volcanic too. They also eat Avenger Shield and divide toll bounces, it's just an awful, awful room. Another terrible job by Blizzard in this dungeon. I, I mean, I'm glad that they managed to gather all of the badness up into one place at least, so it's easy to point at and hate. And I'm usually not this openly critical, but there's really not a positive way to say that they did a bad job, and that is what happened here. Anyways, here's how you deal with it. Sometimes you fight horde NPCs in this area, sometimes you fight alliance, the difference between the two factions is totally cosmetic. The first trash mob in this section is a giant tank. If you didn't use Bloodlust on the Double Dragon Pole and you have it here, you should use it. The tank only has two skills, but they are insanely dangerous. It uses a mortar, which drops a bunch of fire around and on top of one player. There is a small opening in the Ring of Fire, so they should try to walk out of it without walking through the flames. It can target the tank, like you, or at least players who are standing on top of you, so you should be prepared to deal with this mechanic too. The other ability summons a bunch of Dwarven Suicide Bombers, and you just want to CC and AoE these little guys down. Beer Druids are pretty good here again because they can drop a Rassal's Vortex where the Dwarves are spawning, and then they basically just get locked in jail and burned to a crisp. The second pull here is a 3 mob pull with 2 supports and a Lieutenant. The Lieutenant spam casts area denial circles on the ground. If it's an Alliance Paladin, then the Consecrations look pretty cool. If it's the Horde Shaman, the Earthquakes look kind of lame. Either way, you just want to step out of them. It will also try to heal when any of the mobs in this pull are at low health, so be sure to interrupt that. The supports cast Rallying Cry on themselves and try to attack you with a Stun Cone. Just sidestep the stuns and cleave down the supports. Once they are dead, the boss will spawn. After you kill him, you want to leave this area and you don't want to go back the way you came. You will need to skip the three trash pulls of flying mobs. They patrol around the bridge out of here and they're not too difficult to skip, you just have to wait for an opening. I always hold up a bit once I get to the portal, just to make sure that none of the DPS have accidentally walked into them because then they won't be able to take the teleport if they're in combat. Once the group has gotten through the skip, just ride straight through into the next area. Be sure to avoid the balls. They won't do anything to you if you touch them, but they will explode on a delay, and that explosion knocks back anyone they hit, which will launch them off the platform and kill them. If you're the last person through, you can ride through them all, I guess. I, technically speaking, if everybody gathered up and rode together all at the same time, you could just ride through all of them, but I've never seen a pug group that organized in my life, so I can't imagine uh, that you'd be able to pull that off. It seems like quite a tall order. Harder than doing the rest of the dungeon, I'd say. Once you're in Morchi's room, you just have to pull one trash pack. As long as you stun or in some way crowd control both of the time lost era bots casts, which are electro juiced Giga Blast and Bombing Run, and you focus center up the infinite time bitters dizzying sands, this pull doesn't really have a lot going on. You basically just AoE it down, that's it. Now, if you let those casts go off, then this pull is pretty dangerous. It's very important just to lock those casts down and cleave everything down. Then you fight Morchi. Once you kill Morchi, head back out the same way you came in, and when you hit the fork in the road, take a right. Once you go through that portal, your respawn point moves here in this snowy area. 
there's only one trash pull left and it's very similar to the trash pull after tier except it has two of the guys that force you to run in a circle and interrupt their shield cast also the dragon in this area will hit you with frontal cones deal with that and try to focus one of them down quickly so your healer isn't forced to run around while healing the damage from the big dragon be sure to keep that dragon face away so that nobody gets hit with the frontal cones and once you're done with this pack you're off to an extremely painful boss and then that's the end of the dungeon it's it's not great now let's cover the best bloodlust points i prefer to use bloodlust on the first pull and i chain into the second pull as quickly as possible once that opening pull is dead i also want to lust the double dragon pull after tier if it's up that is a very difficult pull especially on fortified weeks now if it's not available then i just want to use the second lust on the horde slash alliance tank in the timeless battlefield again that's another extremely dangerous trash mob after that i want to use the final bloodlust on chrono lord dios now let's talk about bosses and we'll start with tier tier is a boss that's really straightforward when the group handles him correctly but it can go downhill fast if they don't bait cones into the correct place or if anyone messes up soaks he can be a bit of a group killer which is annoying but he usually gives you a good indication of how the rest of the dungeon is going to go and if a group killer is going to be in a dungeon it's kind of better that it's in the first five minutes than at the very end Tyr has five skills. Titanic Blow is a frontal cone he casts on the tank. This is the main source of tank damage in the fight, and it is what you want to use defensive cooldowns to mitigate. It will hit players behind you in a super long cone, so you want to make sure the boss is facing away from the rest of the group whenever this is coming out. He tracks you with this cone too, so you can't sidestep it. It also knocks you back, so you want to make sure you're not getting knocked off the platform. And finally, just in case there wasn't enough going on with this, it leaves a line on the ground in the direction he hit you, so you will want to reposition him slightly after each cast so the players have space to move around him. In terms of dealing with the knockback, on Monk I use Transcendence, on Warrior, DH, and Druid I charge or fly back, on DK I disadvance, and on Paladin I just get knocked back. Don't get knocked off the platform. Infinite Annihilation is Tyr's other cone attack, the one he points at non-tanks in the group, and it absolutely can be sidestepped. It needs to be. It deals damage, but you just dodge out of it. That's fine. The real danger is that it also leaves behind a pulsing ground AoE that you don't want to stand in. Now, because you're going to be standing near the pillar later in the fight, and you want the players in the group to be between the boss and the outside of the room so that when he turns to slam them, he's turning toward the outside of the room and painting the edges of the room with that cone. Dividing Strike is Tyr's first soak mechanic. He slams a circle around him, dealing damage split among all players inside the circle. He then leaves behind a circle of burning AoE. It deals damage over time, blah, 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 blah. Again, you pull him away from that pull after the slam. This is all of the mechanics in this fight, basically. He has to hit at least two players with the slam, or he gains a permanent 33% damage buff. So you really want to be uh, sure that at least one DPS is soaking the slam along with you. It splits the damage, so the more people are in it, the less it does to each person. This is the point where I use group cooldowns like Darkness, Rallying Cry, Anti-Magic Zone, and so on. Spark of Tear is a dispellable debuff. It deals AoE damage while it's active, and it does a group-wide burst of damage when it's dispelled or when it expires. It's a lot for the healer to manage. Generally speaking, the way the healer is going to deal with this is they will dispel one pretty much instantly, and then they'll let the other expire. There are a lot of other mechanics like this, so that's all pretty normal. The main interaction here is that this debuff comes out right before the Dividing Strike, so if someone still has this debuff on them, they really shouldn't help soak the Dividing Strike. They will probably die unless they have some sort of major defensive cooldown rolling at that time. Finally, Tyr casts Siphon Oathstone when his energy hits zero. He shields himself and summons a bunch of balls around the room. This is the other soak mechanic. They all zoom toward the pylon in the middle of the room, and if you catch them, they give you a 10% haste buff that stacks up to five times. If any orbs hit the pylon, they deal damage to the group and add to Tyr's shield. So you really want to grab every single one of the orbs, even if you already have the maximum of five stacks. It's more important to overcap on orbs and not let one hit than to try and let someone else get a stack. So there it is. Two cones, two soaks, a lot of repetition in this fight. In terms of tanking it, I always start out by tanking Tyr sideways, and I tell the group to bait cones toward the outside of the room. I don't face Tyr towards the middle or the outside of the platform, I try to keep him perpendicular to the outside and walk him around the room in a circle as he fills up this space with his ground effects. 
Each time Tyr casts Infinite Annihilation, I drag him about 20 yards forward so that the ranged DPS will follow him forward, and that's basically all you really have to do in the fight. If your DPS don't move in a position, you can ping where they should be standing, again, between the boss and the outside of the room, and that usually gets them to move over. Time Lost Battlefield is the second boss in this dungeon. It's probably the simplest, but it does have some hidden mechanics. I've already voiced my complaints about this room itself. I feel like I could do an hour long video about that. I really don't care for it, so I won't reiterate that, but I will say this is a deceptively deadly boss that is mechanically simple. You may fight a Horde or an Alliance boss, but they're the same other than the skin and the ability names. The boss has five abilities, but they're significantly less complicated than the other bosses in this dungeon. Mortal Strike is the first ability, it is the main tank attack. It deals a huge amount of physical damage, but more importantly it reduces your healing taken by 75% for 5 seconds. This is very easy to deal with on a monk, Celestial Brew absolutely demolishes this mechanic, but for other tanks like Blood Decay, it can be really spooky. My main recommendation here is to use defensive cooldowns during the cast so you mitigate as much of that hit as you can. And honestly, if you see the timer's about to go up and you aren't at full health, health pot or health stone beforehand. If you do that and you manage your active mitigation well, you won't have too much trouble. Really the biggest thing here is just having a full health pool before you get hit by the mortal strike. Shockwave is the next ability. The boss casts several shockwave cones in random directions, you dodge them, that's it. The third mechanic is for the alliance or for the horde. This deals damage and summons three trash mobs that you will need to pick up. There are three types of trash mobs, a melee guy, a caster, and an archer. The three that you get seem to be randomly chosen. Basically, you just pick them up and cleave them down as quickly as you can. You want to drag the melee guy to the archer, you want to interrupt the caster and drag it to the archer. Pretty normal trash mob stuff. As soon as the boss summons the adds, he will follow up with Bladestorm, and he jumps up in the air toward a party member, casts Bladestorm, and chases after them. He's heavily slowed during the Bladestorm, so it's really not all that dangerous as long as they make a point to run away, but it is pretty deadly for non-tanks if they just stand in it. Now as a tank it's not so bad, I stand in it all the time, don't do that if you're dealing with adds or you're worried about your health at any point, but just know that the main danger for tanks in this fight is the mortal strike and the rest of the mechanics are relatively forgiving. The final boss ability is a passive called Battle Senses. When he kills an enemy, the boss gains a stacking buff that makes him deal party-wide damage with each auto attack. Unfortunately, killing an enemy includes all of the horde NPCs in the room if it's an alliance guy or vice versa, and there isn't really anything you can do about that. I've tried tanking the boss more toward the sides of the room so that a shockwave isn't directly in the middle of the room, hitting everything, and that helps slightly, but not really. He still shockwaves adds, he still bladestorms through adds, and kills them. There's just not all that much you can do. Attack speed slows are very valuable for this mechanic, so a rogue with numbing poison, a warlock using curse of weakness, or a death knight with insidious chill are all going to massively reduce this boss's damage with battle senses. And those attack speed slows all stack with each other, so having a warlock and a rogue can cut this boss's group damage by more than 40%, which is buck wild. So in terms of tanking the boss, I start off by pulling him away from the wall just a little bit so that the group has room to maneuver around him for the shockwaves. I don't drag him to the middle of the room, really, just slightly away from the edge. I immediately prepare for the mortal strike as that is the big tank killer of the fight, and that's basically all there is to the fight, really. Dodge the shockwaves, pick up the adds, UCDs on mortal strike. Simple stuff. Hard hitting but not that complex. The only nasty affix overlaps on this fight are storming and entangling as they both can interfere when you're trying to deal with uh, moving out of shockwaves or, or the blade storm. If I'm on a paladin and someone in the group is struggling with the blade storm, I will often just bop them, but that's not really been an issue anymore since the nerfs. Now let's talk about Morchi. She's my favorite boss in the dungeon. I think she's legitimately very good. I think her abilities and voice lines are all really like I'm on board with them. She also has a mechanic that really just tests your ability to look around and see what's happening in game, and those are always a good change of pace from the usual mechanic of reading an add-on or managing an ability timer, or just the boss randomly does damage. Morchi has four main mechanics. Sand Blast is, once again, a frontal cone pointed at the tank. You need to keep Morchi pointed away from the rest of the group throughout the fight. That's pretty much all there is to it. It deals physical damage, so it's really not all that dangerous to the tank, but it will absolutely one bank non-tanks. So you really, really need to make sure that you don't hit anyone else with it. Frontal cones, what a concept. 
Morchi's second mechanic is more problems. She splits into a bunch of clones of herself that are all wearing different hats. This is important. It's fun, but it is important. The clones all spread around the outside of the room and they all start casting Dragon's Breath. When they finish casting, all of the clones will disappear, the original Morchi turns into a dragon, and she fans the room with Dragon's Breath, which deals a massive amount of magic damage and applies a big long dot, and it's basically lethal for non-tanks unless they have an immunity like Divine Shield or Spell Warding. It's pretty dangerous for tanks too, so I would use defensive cooldowns if you get hit by it. I mean, just really don't get hit by it. The way you deal with this mechanic is by looking at all the Morchis when she splits, finding the one that's not wearing a hat, running behind it before she finishes the cast. Ping the real Morchi when you see her too, so that your party members know where to run. Morchi's third mechanic is time traps. She summons a bunch of circles around the room, and if the players run into them, they will root the... It will root you for 30 seconds. Wow, that's so long. They also deal a bunch of damage to the party and apply a stacking dot. It's a bit like bursting, you want to manage that dot. The root is dispellable, but the dot is not. You don't want to touch these traps at all, but you do use them to neutralize the fourth and final mechanic, which is familiar faces. Familiar faces summons clones of all the players in the group, including you. The clones fixate on their real self, and they pretty much just run up and start auto-attacking. This would be fine, but they also deal damage over time to enemies within a five yard radius, so they're kind of like a mobile sanguine patch, and I think I just realized I've uh, given Blizzard the worst idea of all time. Ugh. You can run these mobs into the time traps, and that will stun them until the next time she casts familiar faces. So let's talk about how you tank Morchi. I start out by establishing threat and facing her away from the group. I usually face her toward the wall, but really I just make sure that she's facing away. Dealing with the more problems split is all about looking for Morchi's hair. Find the real Morchi, find her hair, hide behind her, ping her as you're running to her, and that's about it. You can cut corners if you need to. She breathes, does her breath across the room in a wide cone, so there is some safe room out to the sides as well as directly behind her. Managing familiar faces in the time traps is really the hard part of the fight. You want to crowd control all the ads with traps, you want to get rid of the traps and the ads. You can move the ads around with grips, knock them with Ring of Peace and Typhoon, or hard CC them with skills like Paralysis and Polymorph, but they will still pulse damage around them the whole time that they're CC'd, so you really are better off just shutting them off entirely with the trap. That also clears the trap so you have more free space to move around and deal with the more problems casts. There's just one other problem, the dot. You can't dunk all the ads at once. You have to let the dot fall off at least once during the process, or else it's kind of like extending bursting stacks. Someone is going to die. Since you're the tank, having an ad following you and stacking on the boss, pulsing damage around the boss, is really bad if you have melee DPS in your group. Because of this, you want to dunk your ad quickly if you can, so that the rest of the group can deal with their ads accordingly. Now, if other players already dunk their ads and you're at three or four stacks, just hold until the debuff drops and then dunk your ad. As long as you can manage the ad up times quickly and Without killing anybody by stacking the debuff up too high, this fight's actually pretty good and it feels fun. Challenging, but I like it. It's kind of out of place from the rest of this dungeon, but I'll try to just put a positive spin on it and say, I really like this fight, I think it's pretty decent, and I think the character and the voice work is fantastic. Alright, now it's time for pain. Chrono Lord Dios is the final boss in Mirasan's Rise and he is a monster. His tank damage was nerfed a second time, but he still shreds. He is a two-phase fight with adds and several mechanics that overlap in ways that make them all really difficult to deal with. His first ability is Infinity Orb, and he casts this periodically throughout the entire fight. The cooldown is shockingly short too, 18 seconds. Infinity Orb spawns two orbs that slowly drop toward the ground. They have a sand-colored swirly circle underneath them. Standing in the circle slows the orb. When one hits, it debuffs the group, causing them to take 75% more damage from Infinity Orbs for the next four seconds. You want these explosions to be spread out so that the increased damage doesn't wipe the group, and so that the healer has time to catch up in between the hits. It's not just enough for them to be split by 4.1 seconds. You really want them split as much as you possibly can. Basically, before you start the fight, because you're going to be sitting there waiting for RP before you start the fight, you have a conversation and assigned one range player, preferably a range DPS, to stand in one circle, and then everyone else agrees to stay out of the other circle the entirety of the fight. 
You let the one circle hit as fast as it possibly can, you delay the other one as much as you can, and doing this in phase one is pretty easy. In phase two, it can be difficult because Dios covers the ground in sand that deals damage over time, and sometimes that can overlap with the swirlies. Dios' second ability that he uses throughout the fight is Temporal Breath, and it is yet another frontal cone that deals a bunch of damage. It's pointed at the tank, of course, and it deals a big upfront hit and a huge dot over the next 10 seconds. You will want to use defensive cooldowns on this breath effect, it's very deadly. It has been nerfed, but it's still nasty. You also want to point it away from the rest of the group, naturally. Once again, frontal cones, what a concept. Dios' third and final ability in Phase 1 is Summon Infinite Keeper. This summons an ad that runs across the room and opens a portal that summons more ads. The Infinite Keepers will always run across the room before summoning ads. It's very weird. So you need to move the boss over to them to cleave them down to close their portal. They spam cast Infinite Blast, which deals a lot of damage and can't be interrupted, so killing them quickly will reduce damage taken by a lot. The boss summons the Infinite Keepers immediately before casting Temporal Breath, so be sure to hold him still for the breath, keep it faced toward a wall, and then move him over to the adds. After two sets of adds and orbs and breaths, your dragon allies will blast Dios down to around 50% health. He then summons two Infinite Keepers at once. This starts his transition phase. He flies up into the air and you have to burn the Keepers down one after the other. Be sure to pick up all of the adds as they spawn. Once you kill both of the adds, phase two begins. In phase two, Dios stops summoning Infinite Keepers entirely and starts casting Infinite Corruption. Infinite Corruption spawns sands where players are standing over the course of four seconds. Each time you cast this, you want to slowly spread the sand out in a small area, kind of stutter step it, and then move the boss away so that the group has room to maneuver. This cast happens immediately at the start of phase two, so you want to start out by, once you've killed the adds, stacking up as a group and dropping the sand against a wall then moving the boss around the room in a circle, moving away every time he casts Infinite Corruption. Stacking up against a wall as soon as you kill the final ad is critically important for making that phase too doable. A lot of groups have a tendency to just stand in the middle of the room when phase two is about to start, and that fills the middle of the room up with sand at the start of the phase. It like completely cuts the room in half. It massively reduces the amount of space that you have to maneuver for the rest of the fight, which is really, really bad. The sand will despawn eventually, but that's just a really bad way to start off a very difficult phase. So with all that being said, it's kind of a scripted fight. He forces you to stand still and face breaths away from the group, then he forces you to move, either to stack up the boss with adds or to get out of the sand. It's on one of your group's members to stand in infinity orb circles, ultimately, and it's on the rest of the group to not stand in the other circle. The hardest part of phase two is making sure the orbs are soaked correctly. They will overlap with infinite corruption cast, and that can be really dangerous if it's not handled right. This is not an easy fight. But if you do a good job of setting that first infinite corruption sand against the wall in phase two, it is a lot less difficult. Best of luck with it. And that's Murazan's Rise. So I want to end with a couple of questions here. If you like this dungeon, why? No judgment, I'm being sincere. What makes you like this dungeon? I would genuinely like to know. Maybe you'll change my mind. For everyone else, where does this dungeon fall for you? Is it the worst of all time? I said I thought it was in the last video, and then I got asked if I'd forgotten about King's Rest, which I must have, because man, that is a real contender in the worst dungeon of all time contest. I'm sure there are even more that I've blocked from my memory. I think there's a world in which this could have been a good dungeon, but the timer is still too tight. You have to spend so much time in the dungeon running around, riding taxis, and waiting on portals to transfer you from one area to another. It's built like a maze and the in-game map is actively unhelpful. It's the worst dungeon this season by a mile, and I really hope it doesn't come back in season 4. Even with the recent nerfs to how much damage it deals, it's still not great. I like Morchi, and I don't think the entire dungeon is awful, but the bad parts are really brutal, and there are so many of them. Oh well, at least this is the worst it's going to get this season. And there is the silver lining, I guess. I'll try to be positive here. This is not so great, but it makes everything else feel better by comparison. Alright, that's it. Thanks for watching. Bye.